you aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Now, I, I want to welcome our panel, but before we jump into the panel, hello to the Missing Witches Coven. And we're so grateful for all of you, both our panelists and our listeners, for being here. Yes, we witches are philosophers. And we're here today to talk about the word shaman and what that word means, and how we use it, and what that means. But witches are also makers and doers, bit by bit world changers. So today's episode is also functioning as a fundraiser. Risa and I will be contributing our Patreon profits for the month of May to the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal, as we did last year. But... In addition, we are asking our listeners to make a donation uh, reparation. We know that most of you are listening from the United States. So wherever you are, we encourage you to find a local Native women's shelter to support. Some places don't have First Nations specific orgs, but they're still amazing orgs. So we'll also accept donations to shelters for vulnerable women, children, sex workers, or victims of violence. But we would appreciate your focus on support of Indigenous people. Sip. Ah, we've got over a thousand dollars worth of prizes donated by our coven at large just waiting to be yours listeners here's what you're going to do make your donation of ten dollars or more take a screenshot of your receipt and email it to missingwitches at gmail.com with the subject line donation all caps preferably thank you <laughs> what country you're in plus the amount of your donation the amount is important because for every $10, you'll get one entry into the raffle for these prizes. So if you donate $50, you'll get five entries and so on. All of these details will be on our website and socials. Don't panic. Don't grab your pen. Don't pause the episode. It's fine. <laughs> Please note that the material goods for reasons of postage being insane sometimes... <laughs> Um, the winners of those will be limited to North America, but we do have some like online, you know, ritual divination, that kind of thing, prizes. So, you know, let's open it to the world, right? So you're going to take a screenshot of your receipt, email it to missingwitchesit.com with the subject line donation, what country you're in, plus the amount of your donation. I've also put together a list of Canadian orgs to check out for inspiration if you don't no, or, you know, don't feel like Googling, you can go straight to our website and this post will be at the top of our website until this fundraiser is closed. The winners will be chosen on the full moon. So you have a couple weeks to get your entry in. Again, to our listeners, 
to our panelists today, to the people who donated these prizes. This fundraiser is an experiment. So if you think it's a cool idea, please help us make it successful by making a small reparation to First Nations women who have been systematically marginalized and disenfranchised, both socially and economically. Let's raise some money and let's be blown away by what we can do when we work together. So, as quickly as I can, here are the prizes for the donation raffle. Angela, whom you met on our Sawin episode, is a jewelry maker that you can find on Instagram at unearthed.minerals, and she has donated a sterling silver broom necklace. The piece is two and a half inches. I've seen a picture of it. Again, listeners, I'm so jealous. Obviously, it would be very sus if Risa or I won any of these prizes. So, you know, we're not entering, but like, yeah, I'm jealous of y'all for having this opportunity. <laughs> so uh, a, a sterling silver broom, individually placed silver bristles. They slice and polish their raw materials traditional metal smithing techniques, and so on. The broom is body adornment with magic included, Angela says. Loretta, who you know on Instagram as the Death Witch, and you also met her on our Sawin episode, um, has recently, time is uh, a blur right now, but so I want to say recently, but it might not be that recently because time is a blur, uh, launched her own line of magical goods. So she is putting together a gift pack for one of you lucky, lucky witches. It's going to be at least one of each type of item that she does. So an oil, a powder, an incense, and a scrub. And Loretta says, maybe a couple of new goodies she has in the works. It'll be a surprise, but it's coming from Loretta, the Death Witch. So it'll be a good surprise. That I know for sure. You can also check out her range at thedeathwitch.black. Monifa Walker, whom you also know of, has been a guest on the podcast. She's offering a 60-minute natal reading chart. You've heard her so much on the show. She's gifted and a brilliant astrologer. This is a great opportunity to potentially get her insights and, of course, make a reparation at the same time. You can find her at monifawalker.co.uk. Do you remember the Letha episode where we had a lawyer named Melissa? She makes art prints as the salted moon. She does monoprint using herbs. She mindfully links colors and magical symbols and herbs. A lot of them come from her own garden. And she uses the monoprint to make these prints. <laughs> and, you know, she's not precious. You can hang them on the wall, sure. Or you can use them as your altar cloth. You can use them as a one-time spell. You know, rip them, tear them, write on them. She's donated three prints. So you have three opportunities to get in on this. And if you miss it, she is at etsy.com slash shop slash salted moon magic. There's even more. Aaron Heiser at EK Heiser makes customized birth chart essential oil perfume. Each one is a custom blend of essential oils based on your natal chart a combination of plants ruled by the planets of your sun, moon, and rising signs. Erin uses her intuition and her nose, all of her senses, to create these. Um, if you win this, you have to know these placements in your charts. So just keep that in mind, you know. For those of us <laughs> who don't know exactly what time we were born, maybe that's not the one for you. But we have more. But wait, there's even more. Nick, who works out of the Cauldron Black in Salem, Massachusetts, super witchy, and you can find on Instagram, Instagram at Urban Wizard. Now, Nick has been doing, like, being a professional witch for 35 years. So basically, when I didn't know how to spell the word witch, <laughs> Nick was working as a witch. And he, I can't thank you so much, Nick. This is crazy. He has donated $500. So that's like a package worth $500 if you were to go and, you know, buy it from him. And again, 35 years of experience. Um, he 
He has worked with clients and students, public and private. He's ordained and initiated in a variety of traditions, but he specializes in yoga and the intersection of classical yoga theory and modern witchcraft practice. He says that he operates through a multidimensional animist lens with a focus on Greek folklore. And I'll say this again, Nick's content welcomes all traditions at all levels. And if you prefer, can be approached in a purely secular way, which I thought was really interesting. Now, Nick is donating this personally, so you won't be going through Cauldron Black in Salem. You'll be going directly through Nick at Urban Wizard. Thank you again. And the last one is from our own granddaughter, Crow. <laughs> You'll get a one-hour session with granddaughter, Crow, valued at $200. You'll meet GDC, like, in a second. <laughs> so I'll let her describe what a session might look like. But in the meantime, you can check her out at www.granddaughtercrow.com. And... We did it. Oh, <laughs> to my beautiful panelists who sat through that whole speech, which again was longer than I thought it was going to be because our coven is the coolest and came out like crazy to help us raise some money. Again, 10 bucks, 100 bucks. Let's see what we can do. Let's just see what we can do together. So everybody unmute and we'll all do a glorious hello ensemble <laughs> hi. hi everybody hi. Hey. Hey. So, now we're done that's we're all introduced that's it. now that's it yeah <laughs> so, everybody Figure it out. Risa, Risa is here so we'll say hi to Risa first hi Risa Hi, thank you. I'm so excited. I just feel so glowy and like so touched by the gifts of our coven. And I know today is a day in Canada. We honor the women lost to the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And it just feels like really profound to be making a small reparation towards all of those women we've been missing. That's our whole project is, is comes from a place of longing and sorrow and hopefulness. So to be here with you today, honoring that just feels really, really special. So thank you. <sighs> and Michelle, Michelle has been on the podcast a bunch of times. Like I don't even, I lost count somewhere around three, I think. So I think we're at four now. <laughs> but like for those new people coming in. So, uh, Gwei, uh, Deloise, Michelle, uh, I'm the face behind the birch trail that's like my artist name i make jewelry i make regalia i also do uh cultural facilitation um actually something that i'm doing with amanda right now who is the head of this amazing uh program that's uh teaching two-spirit youth how to uh, make regalia so that's kind of a bit of what i'm doing now and i'm excited that you're raising for the native women's shelter because Yes, we're helping for all those that are missing and lost, but the Native Women's Shelter also has programs that give assistance to families who are dealing with uh, these cases as well. So it's helping not only those who have passed, but those who are in the process as well. Yes. You mentioned Amanda, so let's go to Amanda next. <laughs> Hi, Amanda. Hello, Gwe uh, Deloisi, a bugs again. Um, my spirit name is Lynx, um, Mi'kmaq First Nation, um, with my reserve being Lagna Cook First Nation, but currently located in Guelph. Um, it's really nice to be here and meet you all. Um, and it's really nice to know that these causes are being supported by this podcast. It means so much. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> or did I miss something? <laughs> <laughs> and Amanda, Amanda has also been on the show before listeners. So I'll link all of these episodes that these, these people have been on before as well um, in the show notes, because you definitely want to check out the whole oeuvre. <laughs> Let's go to Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Hey. So yeah, my name is Margaret. And uh, I have a background in religious studies and history of religion. Uh, and I've spent several years studying specifically historical Icelandic witchcraft. 
And where are you currently? In Denmark. Denmark. The prize for the furthest uh, web stream goes to Margaret. Thank you for joining <laughs> us from Denmark. So dope. Thank you again. I'm really looking forward to um, this like Nordic perspective. Uh, anyway, we'll get into it, obviously. But first, let's say hi to the GDC. Hey! <laughs> What's up, granddaughter Crow? Hi! Oh, it's so wonderful to be here individually and as a group authentically to unite to have a wonderful dialogue and perspective that may stretch even our minds as a panel so i'm really excited about that but what i'd like to say is yeah it's a so they call me granddaughter crow i am born to the Bilagana clan for the tachini clan so that means i'm a member of the navajo nation as well as dutch heritage so um what do i do I am a public speaker. I am an author. Uh, my latest book is Wisdom of the Natural World, published by Llewellyn Worldwide. You can grab your copy off of Llewellyn Worldwide or just Amazon, Kindle, whatever, or wherever you get your books, because it's probably there. Um, <laughs> secondly, I... Um, also do sessions and basically um, I work with the natural world to empower you, to encourage you, to inspire you, to be your authenticity. So that's all. That's my mission. I also am the uh, executive founding director of the Eagle Heart Foundation, a nonprofit organization founded here in Denver, Colorado, U.S. Um, we are growing and moving and shaking. Basically, what we do is we help with, uh, to uh, educate people on different cultural awareness, as well as direct support to marginalized groups. So if that interests you, you know, feel free to reach out to that too. But I feel really wonderful about the work that we are doing here and the fundraiser that we're doing. And so I'm backing that up with uh, an hour session. Thank you so much for that, for this contribution of sitting in on the panel and that contribution of a prize for a donor. So since I have you here and your face is the biggest one on the screen right now, <laughs> why don't you tell me like whatever, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word shaman? Right. So <clears throat> I like to step back and say that it's a very... From my experience and what I've seen, it's a very useful word. It's almost like a blanket. It's like you might learn martial arts, but everybody calls it karate. And then they say, well, what form of karate are you doing? Oh, well, I'm actually doing Tai Chi or Jiu Jitsu or Taekwondo, which really it doesn't make sense because karate actually is a form of martial arts. But we use that word um, around just as a blanket term. And so it is with shamanism. A lot of people will um, think of it as Native American, which it did not originate in Native America. Um, different tribes will utilize uh, medicine person or whatnot. But at the end of the day, um, a shaman to me is an individual who works with energy, does not dominate nor control it, or manipulate it. it it's an, an individual who works with energy on behalf of the group. And when I say energy, I'm talking spiritual energy, I'm talking mental energy, I'm talking emotional energy, and I'm talking physical energy. And so it basically is um, somebody who works with the natural world, with the spiritual world, with the emotional world, all of that. And some are more specific to certain things, but basically a shaman is a person uh, that is on a, uh, in, in a position where the group recognizes them as being that medicine person. So that's what comes up first for me. Thing like a conduit. You're kind of like a conduit for like all of those things that are like working. Um, so like my, my opinions on shamanism, I guess like I find it to be a very co-opted word. It's like definitely used as like a blanket term now, um, just because it's it's just like one of those co-opted words. I think like we're at a point in our our history where we can pull away from it. Um, a lot of I, I feel like there's like space for reclamation, but we're 
but by the originators of like shamanism. I don't think we're the people, at least on our side of the continent in North America, are not the ones to um, <laughs> to reclaim that kind of word. I'm used to medicine person, medicine healer, yeah. like this kind of thing. And that and, that's what's so interesting to me is that there seems to be like a, a distinction between the word and like the idea or the mm -hmm. word and the thing. And as you know, Michelle, like you were the first person that I, I hit up about this because it seemed to be that like low water mark at what's the, op that low point, um, what happened in January with the, yeah. uh, with the cartoon character who stormed the Capitol and then called himself a, a shaman. And that's when I was kind of like, all right, what does this word even fucking mean at this point? It's 2021. What does it mean? And that's why we're gathered here today. Please like Michelle. Well, help me. We, we, we cover it. We covered it in our last in the last round table discussion, we did a round table discussion on appropriation. On cultural and appropriation, yeah. On cultural appropriation. And I feel like just like the beginning of this podcast episode should just be that like script where like that like what was Jason talking about when he was he was at a fair for Inuit like makers and someone just walked up to them and they're like, Tell me about your shamanic practices. Yeah. Like <laughs> Uh, as you know me, I, I'm, I always like to, I like that we have like roundtable discussions on this because really these kinds of topics are something that there's no one person who's a monolith. There's no one concept that's a monolith. It is a community discussion. It's only something that can be deconstructed through community consultations. <laughs> let's, let's go to Margaret because we are doing this like intersectional. And again, the word itself, we'll get into the like etymology of the word. But again, the way that I see it being used is either like it, it's referring to from an outsider, um, a, a First Nations, you know, medicine person, or it's like a Nordic thing. Like we see so much of that, like Nordic shamanism uh, today, at least, or it's like some baloney. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> a lot of it's like plas plastic shamanism baloney. And I think I remember what I wanted to say because yeah. it's like like I kept saying it's like a community discussion that we need to have because it's like I'm I'm not I'm not a um academic. I'm only talking from my own experience, from my own personal experience and a lot of people might come onto the show and hear our voices and be like this person's a great like resource of like information and like we need to like pull from various sources like it needs to be a community discussion is like what I'm getting to exactly and I think <laughs> that um the the panel that we've put together here is um again it, it was important for me for Margaret to be here to sort of inspect that that geographical aspect of the origins of the word but also because like Again, you know, we talk about it all the time, like we're striving for this non-binary existence where academic approaches are important because they can inform historical context. If you go into the world thinking that you can wear regalia because why not, it's just clothes, but then you learn that the sun dance was illegal up until like, what, 50 years ago, the, one, the 1970s, I want to say, in Canada, maybe the 50s in Canada, the 70s in the United States. So these were the things 50s. that, yeah, so these are things that were like illegal, like you're, it's not legal for you to do this, but you know, 50 years later, when a hipster walks around in this, if you have an, a, a historical context that's been informed by some modicum of study <laughs> that's not given to us in our schools that's important to me you know and that academic in that sense like learning where words come from and how they get used and what happened 50 years ago that might be affecting how we're behaving and thinking today but also the real personal lived experience this is my problem with with academia is that it devalues that real personal lived experience so again the ideal of this podcast <laughs> this panel specifically is to like break that binary of academic and personal you know because I think that there's so much to be gained from 
the intersection of not just this and that, but the intersection of those things, you know, and also to raise money. <laughs> Everybody, please make a donation to, uh, if not the uh, Native Women's Shelter of Montreal, then find your local. Make your donation of $10 or more. Take a screenshot of your receipt and email it to missingwitches at gmail.com with the subject line donation all caps preferably thank you <laughs> what country you're in plus the amount of your donation the amount is important because for every ten dollars you'll get one entry into the raffle for these prizes so if you donate fifty dollars you'll get five entries and so on margaret can you tell us about like nordic shamanism and how that word got absorbed into that part of the world um, if I can just first address something that you said. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, I love that you said the thing about historic context because um, I'm a big believer in the fact that historic context really matters. Um, and especially with things like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not sure when shamanism became a big thing here. I know it has been for a long time, and um, I have my opinions on that. But um, I think there's been, just as uh, I'm assuming in North America, like with sort of like this new age movement, you see groups that are super into quote unquote shamanism, uh, people describing themselves as quote unquote shamans. Um, and I was doing a little research yesterday because, <clears throat> excuse me, I generally, if I see the word shaman or shamanism, I run the other way. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, so I haven't like been keeping track of what's been going on. And like um, the thing that hits me every time I sort of look into this is that we're talking about very different things. Um, it's both academically and popularly um, sort of like an, a very big umbrella term for a lot of different kind of practices. Um, and I think that's the part of the problem with the word shamanism specifically, is that what are we talking about? Um, and when a definition becomes too sort of wide or not like defined enough, then it's not really useful anymore. And I mean, the origins of the word itself is problematic. Um, and I think that needs to be taken into account when we talk about whether it's a word we want to keep or not. Yeah, I did. Thanks for the unmute, Amy. I was like, um, I mean, I'm, I really don't want to step in front of our next guest, Amanda, having an opportunity to speak because I'd really love to hear what you're thinking about this. But if you'll allow me two seconds on the context of the history of the word, because I do want to just agree and amplify that originally the word contained multiples. And so it was it was from the beginning of its usage. Uh, a settler term of oversimplification, right? So even when we, you know, we try to unpack where it came from, was it the German missionaries uh, in Siberia? Was it an indigenous word? Was it an Arabic word for Satan that was being applied to spiritual leaders there? We don't really know, like the first use in Margaret, maybe you know this better than I do, but it seems like the first use comes in sort of the 15th century uh, Russian uh, Christian Orthodox settlers um, encountering indigenous people and encountering people in a place that they already had always narrated as both there's nothing there and two it's full of magic and three for us to own it now we have to go map it so for us to have something like a European colony for us to have something like an empire we have to go map it and so this place that they both said oh there's no one there and it's full of magic now they encounter really diverse people and people who in that diversity had both male female and trans spiritual leaders really explicitly and called them all shaman and wrote stories about them that they could sell to audiences back home to begin to benefit off that 
process. So even from the beginning, and then it sort of gets picked up by these like um, kind of great man thinkers in like anthropology, and I'm doing huge air quotes, right? Where they're like, we're we're gonna like everywhere we look now. Suddenly we see cave paintings, and like, oh look, another great man another great man like and so what was probably like a lot of artists a lot of women a lot of scientists a lot of trans people and and binary people like telling stories about a lot of ways of encountering the world gets summarized by someone who's like oh look another great man like me you know <laughs> and and now and I so I think inherent in the way the word gets used now is the way the word was used then and I think you're so right like we need we need diversity now for both in our planet and in our language to understand what the fuck we've been talking about that's the end of my speech I'm so <laughs> Amanda hi <laughs> um I'm Reflecting back, and I think when um, Margaret said, when I hear the word shaman, I do kind of take a step back and feel guarded around that. And I think it's because I associate um, that word, shamanism, only in my North American context, so it's limited by my knowledge base and what I've learned from my part of the world, so I'm not an expert on it at all. But it feels associated with capitalization or the commodification of spiritual practices and going from community to individualistic. And that wasn't always necessarily the case. Um, when I think of the word shaman, you have um, like distinct roles in various nationhoods and civilizations, but there are assigned roles and depending on the nation in question, some are considered to be within secret societies like the Medewin. And they're initiated through a very like secret practice, something that not everybody's um, privy to or entitled to. But when I think of people who are uh, connected to spirit or medicine, I, I, the words that I prefer to use are like, helpers, facilitators, truth seers, people that genuinely care about others and have that knowledge to benefit their society. That actually got me thinking about um, after the cultural appropriation episode, we, uh, we spoke about like the cultural appropriation of like practices and how you're saying a lot of the, Amanda, how a lot of the practices are closed. I got into an interesting discussion with one of your listeners who wrote me and they're just, yeah, I, some people write me. I, Amy's face is like, whoa, like it, was, it wasn't a negative discussion. It was a positive oh. discussion, <laughs> but it's okay. It involved, oh. a, it involved a negative discussion that they had with another person. Oh. And they're just kind of, that's fine, it's okay. what, a relief, what a relief I was like I felt responsible for somebody coming for you and I got so like angry and emotional it's a good lesson listeners let's let's let our guests finish before you react to their statement I'm muting myself now go ahead Michelle. if there's anything I've learned in all this is to have a heavy block finger <laughs> but um or you just send reparations first and then I'll have a discussion with you so but um <laughs> <laughs> so I had a discussion with someone and it was just about like, you know, um, utilizing gods and figures of like other cultures. And that's where a lot of like the mis where it got misconstrued because people assume a lot of our cultural heroes across different nations are gods. And like, I, I know at least like in like the nations that I am a part of, like we have cultural heroes and different like um i want to say characters they're not characters but they're just like different figureheads that teach us lessons but we don't call them gods they're not gods they're not there for you to worship they're there to like fumble and fall and laugh and teach us lessons like i know in Mi'kmaq culture we have glooscap who's like kind of like our our uh legend hero the sacred clown basically that's about it like like that kind of like crow medicine that like you <laughs> crow is such an important like teacher for me too so i'm like just tripping and falling and learning those lessons but 
that were that's where a lot of the things got construed. So shamanism, like, because I, I popped that into the chat. So according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, it is a Manchu Tungus word for a meaning one who knows. And we, it's like kind of like that conduit. And it's not this figurehead man who is like, I don't know, 50 plus. It's like any age, any gender, any identity can be this person. And because like, I guess the word got construed at a certain point in time, it just got slapped as like the, kind of like the word, like it's, yeah, it's a debated, but to say uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, I don't know for sure, but um, <laughs> so it's just something that got slapped on all indigenous cultures and our cultural teachings and our original instructions. It just got slapped as a word for our religion. And we're not, we don't have a religion. We don't have like a God. There is creator, but creator is everything. Creator has no gender. Like. I love it. And moreover, I wanted to emphasize um, what she was saying. This is GDC again. And um, I am a member of the Navajo Nation and uh, we don't call people shaman. We call, we say that is a singer or that is a hand trembler or that is a, that person understands how to pray with peyote or that person understands the wind. And um, so if you were to go down to the Navajo reservation in the U.S., which is basically the four corners, meaning Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah, and utilize that word, um, the young generation would probably be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, but the older generation would be like, what are you saying? My, um, I do come from a long line of these spiritual people. My Aunt Alice, who passed about a year ago, she was a high priestess of the Peyote Way. And um, my grandfather also, um, he was, a, he was a, a dancer and a singer. And I think that the, just to explain, we say singer because you were taught over that initiated period of how to sing a song that could last a day, four days, nine days. And that is the beauty of it. So secondly, I wanted to emphasize that point that it's not all gods and goddesses within every culture. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. There, there's a story within the Navajo Nation that says there was a beautiful set of twins. One was male and one was female. And they stood on this mountaintop with the wind blowing through their hair. And that was the only time that they were ever seen. But they still exist because their names are thought and memory. So that's kind of a really cool story. So I just wanted to compliment what you were saying about those different things and build on that from another perspective. And, um, but I do agree completely that you can, people, some people just take on the name, oh, I'm a shaman, I'm a shaman. But we need to also delineate between neo-shamanism, a more of a new age type of a, I'm going to take this word on because it gives me the excuse to smoke peyote. Sorry, I went there. Um, usually that falls off at about two years. Um, for people who go to some sort of a spiritual belief, I believe they go to a spiritual belief for two, one of two reasons. One, they want to grow and learn. Two, they want to escape something. Those that want to escape something usually fall off that religion within about two years after the religion starts saying, you need to take responsibility, you're no longer a baby, let's do this. And so when I look at things such as this QAnon shaman and everything, I want to respect everybody's free will. I want to respect everybody's authenticity. But the only cues that, that <laughs> That was funny. The cue that gave me this understanding that he is not of the same definition as I hold is that he says, you can use the world. You can control the energy. You can change reality. And I'm like, dude, go ahead and do this. 
and you will find yourself eating non-organic food in prison. It's really beautiful how you describe that as um, communities having different roles and gifts that they're used to offer to others when they're in need. And I think part of that is also just having humility to be able to um, not be overtaken by ego or the, the cloud of popularity. Yeah, and I think that that's something that, Michelle, you and I were talking about in the lead up to this, is like, we find a lot of times that it's these like, these men, and I, you brought up an example, and I'll let you tell that story, but it reminded me of the man who invented Mormonism, who was like, I found the new truth, and it's the old truth, and it belongs to me, and only I have access to it, and Risa, correct me if I'm wrong, that was basically Gerald Gardner's approach as well, largely to... Right. Wicca. Yeah, and the origin, uh, the origin of Mormonism is it, he he has a he has a, a magic rock that only translates the golden text that only he can he only gets the rock and the text only appear for him and then it's all gone. You so, know, not not to make fun of Mormonism, but so much of Mormonism is turning to this white nationalism right now that you kind of have to look at where this lack of rootedness leads to leads to violence and appropriation. Yeah. I think. And I think that 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 to me really like puts a fine point on what Amanda said. Like if we want to say like someone who is a shaman, we'll say conceptually the word aside, like conceptually is, you know, a a seer, a healer, a medicine person versus someone who takes that word and uses it as like a hierarchical title of them being like closer to God than you or closer to this. Amanda, how did you put it? Humility over ego. And maybe this is where we can make a distinction between someone, I don't know, again, I don't want to say right and wrong because far be it for me to be the one to decide. But I think, you know, if we can, if we can see people taking on this role from a place of humility. um, Yeah. A lot of, so a lot of this, and it happens with like healers. It happens with any, I think that that's a lot of why these people get drawn into like, you know, nationalistic um, ideologies as well is because they have this like idea of it's like a hierarchy and, you know, you have the healer, or the shaman, and they're the ones that are above everybody and people are just like worshiping them. And even like, like it's so, it's so problematic, but not just like, in settlers and white people it also happens uh in lateral violence as well where you'll have usually usually it is cis men who are using this hierarchical idea to have people pander over them and just like i i have to cut in because all i can like just envision in my head is those photos that came out from that like storming of the capitol and you have that like dude sitting there not 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 the guy in the buffalo hat that was like too much i although i did saw there was a lot of good memes that came out of it where someone like had him howling and they put it on a shirt and it's just like you know like spirits of a nation powwow 2020 <laughs> Yeah, that guy who is wrapped up in pelts and he's just sitting there looking confused, like, why am I here? And they're just like crudely tied on. So that bring me brings me to my story about Mi'kmaq Jesus. So I've coined this, uh, this I've nicknamed him Mi'kmaq Jesus. And it's funny because this person popped up in my friend and like a discussion in my friend circle last week before this pot, like before we aired this. And there's this guy in Maine who claims himself to be an elder and if you know any elders elders don't go around saying i'm an elder like it's something like you know that's an elder and so this guy (laughs) and i won't say any names or anything just like to we don't want any lawsuits but um (laughs) he he's in maine and he claims himself to be the last healer of the mi'kmaq people because we're so extinct and i know that there's not like a large population down in Maine, but there's a lot of Wabanaki people around that area. So I don't know where he's getting this from. So he is, apparently has been predicted his name by our ancestors 300 years ago. And they said he would arrive now to teach the white people our ways. And he holds something called the Mi'kmaq Copper Scrolls. 
<laughs> and and these scrolls, I guess, is to like teach white people about like our culture. I don't know. So there is like I don't even oh, so Amanda popped into the chat. It speaks about like a lot about cultural disconnection. I'm not even sure if this person is actually Mi'kmaq because he claims to be an elder. He claims he's Mi'kmaq, but he has no community ties. And I don't want to talk about disconnection because I'm someone who's been disconnected from my Mi'kmaq side. But like if you've been in our communities long enough that people call you an elder, you've been adopted somewhere, you have some community tie somewhere that you can be like, hey, I represent these people. Nothing like that. Yeah, the, and, again, the, the distinction being that if you're called an elder, that's one thing. If you come in banging into the group chat, like I'm an elder, that's different. Yeah, yeah it's okay. very different. Yeah. Like, we know there's a disconnection problem. And we know that like, there's a lot of kids who have been taken and are unsure where they belong like through the adoption, through people being stolen through the um, 60 scoop. But I don't think this guy is Mi'kmaq. I think this, this guy is just a plastic shaman who is using this to create lateral violence in our community, but also profit off of the ignorance of settler people. So it, it exists across all like aspects and i'm like the copper scrolls like nobody no mi'kmaq person that i've spoken to knows has never heard of this it's just a bunch of baloney <laughs> <laughs> that's my story of mi'kmaq jesus <laughs> amanda maybe you can talk a little bit about this about you know um trying to retrace your own heritage but being in like the most densely populated you know urban city in Canada like where how how much how much of that disconnection do you think that you personally can even possibly heal is that too big of a question I think that's a really important and deep question maybe one that's really hard to answer but I think connection and the desire and longing for connection is a really vulnerable topic and one that like hits most of our native communities really deeply and it's often used as a weapon um to prove or um hold like hierarchy or importance over some people over others and a lot of the people that are implicated in that are people who have been largely ostracized so those that are two-spirit those that are afro-indigenous um people who have been displaced in many ways um i think also growing up in urban centers i had to come into a lot of embarrassment and shame and uncertainty around connecting to culture because not only is are the impacts of colonialism deep wounds that are felt through the generations but it's also like um wanting to be sure that when you're accessing things you're not coming from a pan-indigenous lens or the it's in embedded in teachings and I think when we're talking about um shamanism and the ways that um predatory behavior kind of goes in hand with it I thought quite a bit about some things that came out in the last year or two people who have um outed abusers and um when before i was <laughs> before the podcast i thought to research some things and then i kind of got reminded of one of our um, teachings of non-interference and what that means is it's kind of like you mind your own business or you stay in your lane but it doesn't necessarily mean you're of no opinion it's just that the way you go about it is with with grace and with that humility so being um maybe fused in stories that don't touch on the direct names of people unless it's um 
something that you need to do for your own healing and that directly impacts you, but to be um, mindful that we learn from experience and then we learn through I'm kind of stuck on, on the word, but um, this kind of um, speaking in story or parable instead of speaking in direct callouts, which is quite popular right now. I want to add on to the callouts thing because that kind of like we notice Instagram now is full of infographics of one person standing on a pedestal and everyone treating that opinion and thing as a monolith when it's not like when we, we I keep coming back it's like community consultation but also we have to be open to question a lot of these like original what are called original teachings because there's a lot of issues with that as well um at least us on the east coast like my Mi'kmaq ancestors are around Nova Scotia. I'm not sure exactly which community because my grandmother was stolen. But um, around that, like we have the teachings where it's just kind of like stay in your own lane. Like you don't want to like name anybody, but that there's no accountability culture. And I feel like a lot of our original teachings are about community accountability and calling in like we spoke like during the last like episodes of like calling in and leaving room for growing leaving room for learning and that's a big problem with a lot of the call out culture now is that it is attack attack and it puts that person on another type of pedestal where it's open to just have the community rip into them rather than allowing them the space to grow and learn because some people just don't know what they're doing is wrong and they need to be like we need to give them the space to understand what they've done wrong but we need to like give them a space where they're going to be open to like learning and people aren't open if they're just attacked but also we can't just stay in our own lane and i have a lot of like issues with some of these teachings because like we've been colonized like for a long time on the east coast through the missionaries that came over when the first boats from France came. And so many of our original teachings have just been lost. And a lot of it has like heavy, like it's like almost this heavy blanket of like patriarchy and like church teachings, concepts of purity, like, and we see that a lot as well. Like my other, the other part of my family comes from Great Lakes from Chif, so my specific line is like OG Cree and there's like in both both nations you have like a lot of um like the whole moon time shaming like the concept that you're so powerful on your moon time that you're gonna just take the power out of everything and it's just kind of like really or is this just like another another means to control like like female bodies or femme like presenting body bodies when it is the men who had more a little bit more freedom than we did like after colonization after when the indian agents came in they're the only ones who are allowed to leave like res they're the only allowed one the only ones allowed to like continue ceremonies in private so like we lose all our ceremonies it becomes egotistical in that way so but yeah i feel like it should be like account it's it's such a double-edged sword because like on one end accountability is great but then it also turns into its own little soapbox and its own like monolith so yeah and i think like that that you know we're we're here in this panel to educate um uh, and for me to be educated that's why like the Missing Witches Project is so fundamental for me because I don't understand a lot of things. But what I can do is like talk to people who maybe understand it differently. I don't even want to say better, but understand it in a different way than I do. And then, because this is what I found with this word, this word shaman, I found that like the more I researched it, the 
the less I understood it, the more confused I became. And maybe that's like, you know, related to shamanism itself, the, the undefinable, you know, characteristic of it, the unknowable, this, this bridge between the known and the unknown. And maybe we find this encapsulated in this single word. But I do uh, obviously like uh, Michelle to address like, yeah, I think you're the one who originally taught me that phrase of call in before you call out. And it's something that I've sort of tried to to carry in my in my heart since that conversation um but i wanted to go to margaret because i really i really see this like again we talked a little bit about like the people using this word and again i'm not talking about who has real access to the word who's rightfully using it and who's not but people who use it a lot um, seem to be like Norwegians and other Nordic people. This is what I've seen in my, you know, primary investigation. This is why I have you who knows more. Um, <laughs> and I wonder about this relationship that we see happening in contemporary spirituality between white supremacy and like, you know, um, Viking religions. I'm not saying there is one, but I'm saying that people are sort of co-opting runes, for example, um, and using those as white power symbols. Is this somehow related to this like whitewashing of the word shaman? Again, these, these, I don't know where my questions are going, but maybe you can help me get there. Mm. Well, this makes me think of uh, something Granddaughter Crow said a little earlier about um, you know, different cultures and different peoples have different words for their sort of spiritual leaders or these different like roles people have, um, spiritual roles. And um, everybody does. All cultures have their own terms, their own words for it. And I guess my problem with shaman or shamanism is that let's be specific about what we're talking about. So <clears throat> If we're talking about something uh, Scandinavian or Nordic specifically, we have our own terms for, you know, spiritual leaders or spiritual practitioners who do certain things or did. Um, but I think part of what's sort of alluring about shamanism and the way it's packaged is that um, a Nordic religion as we see it now in terms of Norse mythology and that, it's a reconstructed religion. It's a reconstructed practice. Um, all we have is like some early medieval written sources that are Christian and the archeological findings. And the thing about that is with archeology, span it's an interpretation. Um, so we don't know for sure how certain objects were used or why they were used. Um, so it's sort of a process of trying to reconstruct um, spiritual practices that have died out a really long time ago. Um, and I think I can understand wanting to look to other cultures and see, okay, may, maybe we use drums like this too, or... And maybe we had similar ceremonies to these people because whatever. Um, I think, unfortunately, often it's founded in sort of a unconscious, um, sort of a racist idea of indigenous people um, as somehow, quote unquote, primitive or sort of original in a sense. And... Um, by the way, there's no such thing as a primitive people, but um, but yeah, I think there's there's a lot of at least where I'm sitting in the world, um, it rings a lot of alarm bells for me. The use of the word, um, also because often the people who say they're shamans or practice shamanism, when you start to look at what it is they're practicing and what it is they're doing, it's stuff that is not native to this part of the world and often is like oh we're doing a sweat lodge and it's like oh no please you know um that's 
that's not ours and not ours to do with or you know um and i think there's a certain level of of ignorance to what what we're doing when we're co-opting practices from all over the world and just um you know google researching or like i don't know um uh, i think there is a lack of like the thing i keep hearing from people who don't see this as a problem is cultural exchange oh but there's always been cultural exchange but cultural exchange implies reciprocity um and when you don't there is no reciprocity in stealing from indigenous people um and just like from the journey i've been on of learning for like the last decade especially um because i mean i was one of those people that had no idea where certain things came from that i was using um but hopefully if you know better you do better um and you know and things don't get really iffy until you know better and refuse to do better um <laughs> Again, like I just, I, I have a friend who has rune tattoos that she's now like super embarrassed and ashamed of. Mm -hmm. And like, I feel for her, you know, because once again, like we see everything being co-opted and used for evil. Like it's not even just like, yeah. <laughs> like we're going to co-opt it and use it for evil. And I really, the listeners couldn't hear me snapping, but when you said that cultural exchange implies of reciprocity i think listeners like let's put that in our pockets like if you want to give this this cultural exchange argument then what are you giving back yeah you know we've had people on the podcast before say similar things like you think a lot about what you're taking and i'm entitled to this and i'm entitled to that mm -hmm. like take a minute and maybe this is a great opportunity <laughs> to do a little bit of reparations here's yes. the here's the rundown on the fundraiser everybody make your donation of ten dollars or more Take a screenshot of your receipt and email it to missingwitches at gmail.com with the subject line donation, all caps, preferably, thank you. What country you're in plus the amount of your donation. The amount is important because for every $10, you'll get one entry into the raffle for these prizes. So if you donate $50, you'll get five entries and so on. All of these details will be on our website and socials. Don't panic. Don't grab your pen. Don't pause the episode. It's fine. <laughs> I wanted to bring something up that Amanda, Michelle, you touched on it. We all kind of touched on it on this idea, like outside of, you know, in primary school. And, and again, Margaret, you used the word primitive and we're using big fingered hair air quotes here. Primitive. That was my first encounter with the word shaman. shaman. You know, it's like a man. It's a primitive spiritual man. Again, I know you got you all can't see me, but like the air quotes are just constant here as I as I say all this. But outside of that, outside of like my colonial education, the first time I ran into the word shaman, GDC, you you mentioned this too a little bit. Um, was because I I came up, I sort of came of age in like a rave culture where a drug culture, I'll be more specific, a drug culture, um, and people would talk about, there were certain drugs that were super heavy, like DMT, I never took it myself, but you had to have a DMT shaman. Again, I'm using air quotes, you had to have a DMT shaman, you had to have a DMT shaman. And I mean, for one, that like is a way that it, the word sort of infiltrated into my life, but I, uh, listening to you all talk, it really made me think too, especially you, Amanda, that when we make it this, this this hierarchy, someone, especially someone who's on heavy drugs, is going to be the most vulnerable person at the party. And now we've taken this person that we've given this, I don't know, crown, scepter, title to, and put them in charge of the most vulnerable person in our gang. Um, I, I hope that some of you have something to say about that, but I just really, again, wanted to underscore, like, when people take on these mantles, thank you, Granddaughter Crow, when people take on these mantles and then also are, are trying to attract vulnerable people, that to me is a very dangerous combination. GDC, can Absolutely. you talk to that? Absolutely. So there, I think that I, I have this concept and I study it as well, 
the language that you speak is the language that you think, which constitutes your worldview. So I want to say this. I was Navajo Native American before it was quote unquote cool. <laughs> I, um, so I come at this from a very different position. And another point that I want to make is my mother is full Dutch, Van Wyck, Van Mersbergen. She is really, really Dutch. And my father is full blood Navajo. English is his second language. He still walks the earth on this side, which is a blessing to us all, but he was taken at the age of eight, nine from his Hogan and his hair was cut and he was moved into the boarding school. He was denied his language and so it is. That's how close to that experience that I am. Then as I began to be between these cowboy and Indian different thought processes, it, it, it made it very difficult for me because sometimes I would be like, hey, I'm a little white child. And then I'd be like, you savage natives, primal, quote unquote. And then I would say, hey, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little Indian, Native American. You took my land. Well, being half and half, will hate half of me any stance. And so it is that I have become a bridge. And I, I do want to talk about the concept, back to the concept of the way that people think. In certain languages, the worldview of leader means one on top leading those on the bottom. Me? No. My degree is in leadership. There are different types of things, but that my, my belief as a leader, as a conduit, as a whatever that you guys label me as, which I want to say something about that too, is that I am the bottom and it is up to me to empower and push you guys up to your fullness. So hence the idea of having a leader bastardized and said that this is the person on the top that we must all follow, it really gets to my gut. I'm like, no, a true leader, a servant leader, yes, there are leaders who are very, you know, much like that, but a, a servant leader, the way that I have chose to lead, the way that I was raised to lead is that the leader is at the bottom holding everybody else up. And if there is a mistake, the leader will take the blame, but if there is a glory, the leader will give that glory to the other people. So think about that and think if you really want to be called a leader. Nevertheless, um, I digress. One thing I guess I did want to share, and I know I'm getting, woo, but I did want to share that as I, as I grew up and then I, I left the, the corporate world, and I decided to open up major consulting doing business as Granddaughter Crow um, to be my authenticity. I um, thought to myself, by this time, people are starting to get hip to this Native American. They're like, ooh, you have really dark eyes. Wow, you tan fast, you know. Teach us something in your language, you know, and this and that. And so I was like, wow, this is really different than me hiding it when I was a kid. So I'm like, okay but I'm the last person to use my native side as um, for capitalism. I wrote my first book and I didn't know what the cover looks like until somebody said, well, why don't you put a freaking old native on there? And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. And they're like, well, everybody else does and you actually can. So I thought that was really funny. But in this growth um, as, a, as, a, as a learner, a lifetime time learner, I thought to myself, it came across to me, people started asking me, are you a shaman? Are you a shaman? Are you a shaman? Teach us shamanism. Teach us shamanism. And I thought in my little English speaking Dutch mind, oh, well, I suppose I need to get a certificate. Like, what does that look like? Do I need to go to school for this? And I'm not saying that that's right or wrong, but I went down to the res where I talked to my aunt Alice, who doesn't speak English. Um, so my dad translates half of it. And I sat down with her and she says, one day, the wind changed, so I followed it. It led me up to the, the top of the mountain, and then the wind stopped, so I stopped. 
And I started looking around and I found the flower and it taught me its medicine. So I carry its medicine to the world. So at that point I was like, okay, well, that's cool. And then people kept pushing me because I'm native. And I, that's the first thing I'm just like, it's not a native word, but okay, that's, you know, I, I get it. You know, I, I get it. You know, it, it does identify somebody who in your mind may believe it's something to be, but I just kind of say to people that there are so many different types. There's traditional shamanism within each culture. And to say shaman to a Navajo, uh, a true Navajo will say, what are you, what is this word? What is this word? I do not know what you're saying. And, um, but I think that I just, I feel like so much energy from the circle. I feel like I need to stop talking because I think that somebody else has something really important to say. But I just want to say that a lot of times people will position themselves in a position so that they have power over and control over. And if you, in my doctoral leadership opinion, say, if you are going to behave like that, then, uh, you know, pride cometh before the fall. But if you do want to be a leader, then that is pure self-sacrifice. You carry the burden of the shame of what has happened and you lift the people and give them the empowerment. And that's how I see that. Amanda dropped something in the chat that the loudest voice in the room isn't necessarily the wisest or the strongest. Thank you for that, Amanda. Michelle, I know. I was listening to GDC talk and I was like, oh, I know Michelle's got something to say about this. I was writing stuff down. So <laughs> I'm like, I got it right here. Good, good. Hit it. Hit it. <laughs> Cause like I really, I really resonate with a lot that you say, like when you have like those like two sides of you or multiple sides, like my my mom is where I'm indigenous from and I always use the term indigenous even though it's a blanket term because I'm both First Nations and Métis. Um, my dad is Irish, Scottish and Quebecois and we talk about like identity and how it's been removed and it's something that like I grew up with. I was raised like we are a native family like that was what we were taught even though like I speak about it when we had our first interview where there's like that disconnectedness just because like culture has been violently ripped from my grandparents. But like you, to this day, like my mom will be like, I'm a native person, but then uh, like she won't like assume that identity because there's always that like, I'm not too sure. I don't want to say it because of like, you know, the replica, the, like the, the uh, reputation or whatever you want to call it that comes with it so um that was like one thing I also had like you know those like fake native proverbs I think we can have like a lovely native proverb now that is like um it came to me in a dream <laughs> that is like when we talk about like certificates and like you know like when you're looking for when you're talking to a knowledge keeper or a healer or someone who is like going to help elevate you in a lot of like settler societies or like this kind of like European idea that you need to like go to school to achieve this thing when there's like a lot of times it's like no I just like went and I spoke to the tree like I went and talked to this plant and I met this plant and we talked and we had a little reciprocal like exchange and it taught me what I needed to know. <laughs> Of course, and you're talking to whoever, they're going to be like, okay, like, <laughs> you need to go see someone. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but that's the thing that we need to like, you know, came to me in a dream. I, I'll cut in really quick because when, <laughs> when we spoke, I don't know if it was the first or the second, or whenever it was, and you were talking about people saying that they were indigenous in a former life. Oh, and man. I was like, I was like, no, people don't say that. And then I was reading Buffy St. Marie's biography. I did. It's not that I didn't believe you. It's that I was like, people couldn't possibly say that. You're like, there's more but, than one yeah. person <laughs> experienced this. And then I'm reading Buffy St. Marie's biography and she's talking about people like this again. And it coincides with this new age movement. And like, again, this is like a... a a thing that Risa and I are really like interested in what the fuck is going on. We haven't found an answer yet. We're super grateful to all of you for helping us try to get there. But I, like... I think this might like help pull like another idea that I actually wrote. I'm just going to post it before I forget about it. But um, cause people 
especially people who have come from Europe and now they've settled here and now let's say they're however many generations in, they've been here since the 1600s, they have no ties to the land and they're looking for that tie to the land that is going to make them belong. They don't feel a sense of belonging because their ancestors are coming from across the water. So, you know, oh, I was native in a past life. That definitely ties me to this land. So that like definitely makes it okay. Like, right. And people are so like, people are so bent on like percentages and like, you know, blood quantum ideas of fractions. And it's always like, how, what percentage are you? What's this and that? And it's like, I am not halves of anything. I am like, I am full Bachip. I am full Ilnu. I am full Scottish. Like, all of these parts are just facets of like my being. <laughs> and I've said this in other podcasts too, because like when we talk about like whiteness and people stuck on this idea of whiteness, you're not white. White is not a culture unless you're a white supremacist. You're like what? You're Scottish, you're Irish, you're British, you're Welsh, you're like Norwegian, you're like, there's like so many facets out there. It's not Viking. <laughs> And um, bringing it down to this weird, like, whole, con like, idea of, like, white nationalists just kind of being like, yeah, shamanism, natives, like, you know, we're on the same side. There is a huge problem with white nationalists trying to prey on indigenous people, because they're just kind of like, hey, are you upset about immigrants coming to this land? Because those are the bad ones, and we're the good ones, and we're going to fight for like this land of yours and da, da 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 Like, I don't know, like like where I grew up in Toronto, like, and specifically like in a lovely little town that both me and Amy experienced called Oshawa. <laughs> Represent. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's just like, there is this odd fascination of white nationalists or neo-Nazis who are just like yeah we accept native people like you know like we're on the same team like they they try to recruit them it's really like a really really bizarre like phenomenon and i really think probably the nazi thing was that winnie two thing i told you about which i'm gonna plug that again if you haven't seen searching for winnie two you need to google searching for winnie two it's a documentary about why german people have powwows <laughs> it's free in Canada because it's a uh, Drew Hayden that did it he's an author here but um basically like German there's this like book that came out and it's about Winnie too who's supposed to be an Apache warrior that hunted buffalo which like it's just the person who wrote the book has never been in North America and it's just like this whole like fantasy of like how we're free out here and you know living off the land and it's like the german people trying to like tie back to germanic roots of like you know that freedom of like living off the land and now it's as big as disney winnie too is like mickey mouse from what i hear so <laughs> and there's this you made me think of this problematic thing that colonialism has done and and you know keeps doing um at least when i was in school that this sort of um idea that it's like African culture is one thing, like Africa is one thing, or indigenous culture, like indigenous culture is one thing. But if you try to tell a, a French man that he's the same as a German man, then, <laughs> you know, he's going to tell you many, many things about why that's not true. But we have these spaces like Turtle Island, like the continent of Africa, that are huge and vast, and but we're like, you know, African spirituality, like as if it's one thing, indigenous spirituality as if it's one thing. Well, if you think of the Celts, that's the best way I can like describe it is the Celts. They were comprised of like the Scottish, the Irish, and the French. It's like a blanket. It's like a blanket term. Like they were a migratory people. Like my Irish Celtic ancestors did not originate in that island they were originally coming from they think they were flemish originally if you go back to like the year 1000 or whatever it's like it's just that kind of like blanket term but yeah. everyone's like yeah 
Ireland. We, Ireland. <laughs> we, we said the same thing about the word shamanism, that it is this blanket term. So maybe like together, the six of us can come to a conclusion wherein like anything that's a blanket term is going to be reductive, is going to be watered down, is going to be not of the source, is going to be you know, through the telephone game. Do kids still play telephone game? Um, you know, where it, it's like, it, it's, it's, it's made a blanket because it's been stretched so thin. Does that metaphor make any sense to anybody? I see some nods. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> goodness. I think also like capitalism and colonialism work, benefit, by simplifying, homogenizing, like Amanda said, and and selling us the simplest possible idea to keep, you know, to keep selling us stuff. Um, and so we, people, you know, white settlers in North America fall prey to constantly re-victimizing indigenous people because they've over centuries lost their own indigeneity, suffered the violence of the church, suffered the violence of capitalism, and just sort of we're, we're, there's, a, there's a wound there that is in all of us that's playing out this sort of constant cascading failure, re-victimizing each other. And I think coming together around the word shaman indicates you know, it's a word that's like a talisman for this whole process, you know. I know, Margaret, you wanted, you, you had, I think, more to tell us about racism <laughs> in, in the sort of the way that Nordic cultures have um, maybe been used and are using white nationalism or, or Nazism. Yeah, I just, um, Amy mentioned the runes and like how they've been co-opted by white supremacists and white nationalism and, and um, I just wanted to touch on that really quickly because it's um, I think it's it's to a point now where it's a little painful for some of us um, that um, that it's that it's become so synonymous with white supremacy and that like um, I mean I have I have runes tattooed I have a and I also have a um, a 16th century uh, sigil on my back that's Icelandic but um but for me these are things that are you know part of my heritage they have connection to where I'm from and um and it's really it's really upsetting and tiring um to see sort of first of all like this sort of like um I don't know, boiled down weird version of, of like, of Scandinavian and Nordic prehistory and history into some like, I don't know, Vikings, <laughs> which is so uh, inadequate and misunderstood. And it's, and it's really hard to watch people, um, basically take your culture and your, you know, your sort of, um, you know, part of what makes you you and part of what makes your, your people the way they are and like drag it through the mud, basically. And, um, and I mean, it happens here. We have white supremacists here who use, um, who use, you know, Nordic religion and Norse mythology this way and um and that's sort of our own problem to deal with but uh I know a lot of people who get really frustrated watching watching white nationalists in the U.S. um sort of co-opting something that they don't understand uh, apart from like the episodes of Vikings they've watched or whatever and um and yeah make it sort of this like this weird cartoon mythology for whiteness and uh yeah it's it's just it's really disgusting and distressing to watch um and at the same time we do have in sort of the Norse heathen neo-pagan community we have a problem with white nationalism we do have a problem with white supremacy and um 
and that sort of attests to a larger problem of not addressing racism and um, and systemic racism in societies here because we're like, oh, but we're so, you know, homogenous. We are not racist. Um, so yeah, that was my long rant. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us have our various and sundry um, things that we get upset about when we see people who clearly, like you say, don't understand them. For some of us, they're, um, you know, ancestral um, and or ethnic. Um, and f for some of us, you know, like I, I consider myself a witch, I consider myself a, a lifelong witch. And, you know, one of the first things that we talked about on the podcast, I think it was honestly like episode two, <laughs> um, where I was interviewing a person and we were talking about the, um, the Sephora witch kit. Um, you know, I say everybody, you guys can't, you, you gang can't hear them, but everyone's like, yeah, you know, so we, uh, raise your hand, who has the most to get off your chest about this kind of like, uh, GDC, GDC up to bat, like, it, it seems like, you know, uh, Margaret is talking about how painful it is to see these sacred things, you know, being used for white supremacy and and uh, obviously you know Michelle and Amanda and, and GDC you're talking about seeing these things that are part of your ancestral DNA you know just being absolutely just made illegal on plus not just like demonized but like illegalized and you know it, anyway you do you don't need to me to carry on with that but yeah <laughs> yeah there, this I love it this pain that comes from yes. the, the lack of understanding when, when you see someone using your tools, yes. however you decide your tools are. GDC, can you, can you go off? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I actually want to, not that I haven't been before, but I really would love to address the audience and to let you know that um, we all have pains we all have stances and this is a good thing because that means that we are all becoming more authentic right we are becoming authentic and how do we move forward we need to have more of these dialogues we want i don't know what i don't know you know and i think that this is where don't like i seriously have had people come up to me as gdc you know and i'm working i've got like you know a hat you, you can tell i'm native when i'm when i'm at work and um they come up to me and they tell me they apologize for what their family has done so i have to step into the position of taking on the identity of native american not you know of, of everyone to forgive this soul and you know it's so it's it's very interesting so what i'm suggesting is if you heard something today that caused you to open your mind or learn about a different perspective within the circle, cheers to you. That's what we're doing here. I learned, I was schooled today. Do not be embarrassed about going, oh, there isn't, we don't all hold all of the knowledge in our head. This is why we sit in circle. I will learn something from across the Great Lake from Denmark, is it? And, um, you know, it's, and, and Montreal and the East Coast and the West Coast. And then I actually, sometimes I learn something by what just comes out of my mouth. But I'm saying is, we all have some pain. Now we're talking about it. Do you know how many years we haven't talked about it? We have accepted some sort of a cloak of how you are supposed to be as a, like, because of a gender thing, because of a cultural thing, because of a religious thing that you have to fit in this cookie cutter box. Now we get to talk about it. And the first thing that we get to say is, Oh, you know what I've been holding my breath on is how come this person says this and they think that. And so there is a level of frustration that comes out, but it's that fire that gets it cooking. Now, don't be insulted. Don't, don't be shamed. I'm really asking you, and I'm not speaking for the panel, but I am speaking from GDC herself. We all get to learn something new. The, the whole thing is know that you don't know everything learn how to study things from credible sources 
learn how to express yourself on your authentic, on authentic story, take your authentic experience, and it has a place in the circle. It has a place in the circle. So take this, because we are allowed to talk so freely about this, and that this is coming to you, that is a position of more and more dialogue, more and more curiosity, and more authenticity. May this give you permission to have your own ideas. And in that, always know that somebody else has another perspective and that we are here to learn and be curious about this. So that's what I have to say. Can you, GDC, you said something to me either in one of our previous conversations or in an email about the seasons and obviously the seasons of nature, but like uh, personally, it really yeah. affected me. Can you like lay that on us as yeah. a group? Yeah, yeah. Um, so not to like self-promo. But <laughs> Tell us about your book. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so Wisdom of the Natural World really, it's, it says Wisdom of the Natural World by Granddaughter Crow. Um, spiritual and practical teachings from plants, animals, and Mother Earth. And so there'll be a chapter on how we are communicating with the natural world, irregardless of whether you speak English or not, um, because it's all about body language, right? And so then it has animals, it has plants, it has all these things. But what Amy is talking about is maybe look at the, the seasons and how they roll wherever you stand on the globe, you have different seasons. And the spring is a season to plant, and the summer is a season to grow, and the autumn is a season to harvest, and the winter is time to just be, and wait for the next spring, recognizing that we will always roll through these processes. And when I might be in a winter in my home life, like under the pandemic, but in my physical world, but I might be in the summer in my career. And so don't force the seasons, know the seasons and be in whatever season you're in. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly it. Because, you know, I, I, I live in Northern Quebec. The seasons are very fucking clear <laughs> and so when you said that to me you gave me this permission to like live within the seasons but also recognize like the seasons of my body and my spirit and and to recognize those seasons too and not to necessarily assign them like yeah. this time you do this and it we was really a release approach me, it without I, yeah. exactly approach it without judgment and i and i love what you just said amy it you get to give yourself permission. And so what I would like to pose to the listening, the listeners out there, what are you going to give yourself permission to do or think today? What is the best part of you that you need to give yourself permission to take a break? You need to give yourself permission to um, self-love Saturday. Today is my day. You know, you need to, you know, and, and, and the concept of having to give yourself permission only speaks to the negative construct that our societies have been in that say that we need to ask for permission in the first place, which don't get me going there, but be who you are. You have the right to do it. If you need permission to be who you are, I will give you that permission until you can take it yourself. I thank you so much, GDC, for the permission for all of us. <laughs> now, I want to um, start with Amanda. Amanda, what do you want to get off your chest? Like, we're talking about being open and honest, and this is a place where you can just tell our listeners what you want them to hear. Oh, I, I feel like I'm just reflecting off of um, a shared feeling that a lot of us have, but... Um, it's difficult to witness the ease that others can co-opt cultural or spiritual practices when our relatives or our ancestors have had to hide their identity out of either necessity or self-preservation or by simply being attacked um, in 1921. So it's like the hundred anniversary of when the deputy superintendent of Canada told native people to stop dancing so much 
and to dissuade and prevent them from being indulgent and discouraged. Uh, these are the words in the letter. It's like an old timey typewriter letter um, that was found. It's a really old document to discourage their sloth and idleness, saying that they were being unproductive. And when you think about it, um, these are spiritual practices. These are ways in which we connect with um, our spirit body um, and to be of service to our communities and to and and not to use the word shaman, but it is a very shamanistic and meditative practice of uh, dancing. Um, something that took me a really long time to understand from an, an outsider perspective than reconnecting as um, somebody that's been culturally displaced, but uh, now become the cool thing to do. And people um, re disregard that history. Thank you so much for speaking that, Amanda. I'm going to pass to Margaret. Margaret, go off. What are you going to get off your chest? Um, I think what I really want to get off my chest at this point is just, I really want to encourage people to do their research um, and be critical and think about what you're doing and when it comes to your spiritual practice um yeah do your research figure out where do these things come from um am i am i adding to or sort of perpetuating something really painful or um am i co-opting something that isn't mine to use or and I mean, like I said earlier, when you know better, hopefully you do better. And like we don't, like Granddaughter Crow said, I think what she said was really powerful. <laughs> um, but like you can't do better if you don't know better. Um, but you have, I think, in this day and age where information is so easy to come by, you have no excuse to be ignorant. Um, and I mean, just something as simple as Instagram as a platform. I've learned so much uh, just from following, you know, different people. And I will especially learned a lot from indigenous women. Um, and I mean, like being educated about things I knew nothing about, about, you know, why we shouldn't use this or that, or um, practices that I didn't realize were harmful to, you know, be using as a white person. Um, and like, I, I didn't know, I always know everything. I still don't know everything. I make mistakes. I fuck up. We all do. And that's okay. Um, but commit yourself to doing better and to doing your research and to educating yourself. And, and like we talked about way at the beginning, historical context is important and it matters. Um, and it often helps you understand why people feel a certain way um about things like why certain things are a no-go for you to borrow quote unquote um uh, yeah i think that's that's my my main thing to get off my chest at the moment yeah that really yeah thank you so much again like uh, once again i just want to underscore that what we're trying to do here as an ideal is to take away that that barrier between like an academic study and a, a real personal emotional response to the world around you. And I really appreciate what you said. I think that that speaks to that exactly. Thank you again so much, Margaret. Michelle, oh, I know you got a beast to unleash. Hit us. <laughs> I always do. Yeah. <laughs> One um, of the many reasons that I love you so deeply is that you've always got a beast just waiting to be let off the leash. Let's hear it. I'm gonna like pull it back to the first discussion because our very first podcast interview was about spiritual bypassing and it's something I popped into the chat and it's just kind of like the whole concept of like plastic shamanism and like that um you can't sell a lifelong path in a four-day online course it's not going to give you like this fancy certificate that I'm like I can do all these things and my like I'm here now, I've made it. It's like, it's a lifelong path. It's you're constantly learning. Just kids learn, 
elders are constantly learning, no matter at what stage you are in your life, you have to be open to people challenging your beliefs and you have to be open to challenge your own beliefs. And then that brings me to what's on my chest is it's great. I love like pulling information from social media, but at a certain point it's becoming, it's creating a lot more binary as we like get really deep into it because a lot of people are just like taking one or two like infographics or one or two sources on Instagram or on Facebook. And they're like, yes, this is the monolith. This is like why all of this is horrible. Like this is the one thing I need to like listen to when you need to pull from like multiple sources. And that's what I keep, what I spoke about at the beginning of the podcast is community consulting. You can't just get your, uh, you just can't get your, all your resources from Instagram. You can't get all your resources from Facebook. You need to like go into your community. You need to like learn whose land you're standing on and, and hear what they're talking about. Cause like one person, like even within a community in itself, there are multiple opinions on like just in itself. So it needs to be an open and an ongoing discussion and we can't create more binaries. Like we're trying to remove these binaries that we've been stuck in. You, I remember our first communication was you, speaking of Instagram, you uh, put a comment on a post. It was an interview that I had done with Annie Lemerho. And you were like, um, you know, I appreciate this. I find that like in the, in the pagan community that, you know, indigenous people are often ignored. I can't remember what the exact, you know, something to that effect. And I, I knew nothing about the pagan community. Like I knew what I had done and I knew, you know, what Risa and I were doing, uh, but I had no idea what the pagan community, I'm using air quotes here, was doing. And when Michelle, you told me that like the indigenous community was being ignored, that seemed really like missing the point of paganism entirely to not include this perspective so once again i want to thank i want to thank you specifically michelle but all of you for like helping me foster my understanding of like my own belief systems which you know your beliefs can change people and it's ideal if you're if you are you know presented with something else so let's all unmute um, and as you're doing that, I'm going to read this quote from Freya Norling, who is not without problematicness. So keep that in mind, everybody. Language is not capable of describing true shamanism or the shamanic experience. And I think we've kind of established that here today between the six of us that we came to talk about a word and came to no conclusions other than recipro <laughs> reciprocity, research, Compassion. Does anybody want to throw out some more words that we know for sure? Approach life with curiosity in everything that you do, because then those defense mechanisms will drop. Approach it like a child that you get to learn something new. Don't make assumptions that it's going to be painful or that you're going to find out that you're wrong. Be curious. Curious. I love that word as a as a final thought. <laughs> Risa, do you want to say goodbye to our listeners? Just thanks so much to our beautiful guests. I see your hearts and your wisdom and everything that you shared in your words and all the things that sometimes you held back and couldn't share. Those were all gifts for us and our listeners. Um, we always say that we're a circle that we make in the darkness between our ears. And so I like to imagine all of those people in that spiraling circle of darkness out around us, just holding you and the things you said and the things you couldn't say. So thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for your donations today and all month. Yes. So uh, I'm going to hit you all listeners with that speech one more time. And uh, thank you again, Margaret, GDC, Michelle, Amanda, Risa for being here with me. Like, I would love to do this as often as possible. Let's hope we raise as much money as we can that'll really encourage us to just keep doing this over and over and over again. I know, once again, we all have lives to live and I would love to just share an apartment with the five of you and just have this conversation constantly going. But in the meantime, Michelle, you are going to play us out. Thank you all listeners for your donations, uh, panelists for your time everyone for uh, your compassion and your curiosity. We love you.
I am going to close us off with the wildflower song. And uh, this was a song that was taught to me and the way that I was, uh, I guess, like gifted it or whatever is it's a calling back song. So you use it to like call back your spirit or call back like those who are missing. So I think that's a good one to lead off with. Way up. Yes, we witches are philosophers, and we're here today to talk about the word shaman and what that word means and how we use it and what that means. But witches are also makers and doers, bit by bit world changers. So today's episode is also functioning as a fundraiser. Risa and I will be contributing our Patreon profits for the month of May to the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal, as we did last year. But in addition, we are asking our listeners to make a donation uh, reparation. We know that most of you are listening from the United States. So wherever you are, we encourage you to find a local Native Women's Shelter to support. Some places don't have First Nations specific orgs, but they're still amazing orgs. So we'll also accept donations to shelters for vulnerable women, children, sex workers, or victims of violence. But we would appreciate your focus on support of Indigenous people. Sip. Ah, we've got over a thousand dollars worth of prizes donated by our coven at large just waiting to be yours listeners here's what you're going to do make your donation of ten dollars or more take a screenshot of your receipt and email it to missingwitches at gmail.com with the subject line donation all caps preferably thank you <laughs> what country you're in plus the amount of your donation the amount is important because for every $10, you'll get one entry into the raffle for these prizes. So if you donate $50, you'll get five entries and so on. All of these details will be on our website and socials. Don't panic. Don't grab your pen. Don't pause the episode. It's fine. <laughs> Please note that the material goods for reasons of postage being insane sometimes um, the winners of those will be limited to North America, but we do have some like online, you know, ritual divination, that kind of thing prizes. So, you know, let's open it to the world, right? So you're going to take a screenshot of your receipt, email it to missingwitchesit.com with the subject line donation, what country you're in, plus the amount of your donation. I've also put together a list of Canadian orgs to check out for inspiration if you don't 
no or you know don't feel like googling you can go straight to our website and this post will be at the top of our website until this fundraiser is closed the winners will be chosen on the full moon so you have a couple weeks to get your entry in again to our listeners to our panelists today to the people who donated these prizes this fundraiser is an experiment so if you think it's a cool idea please help us make it successful by making a small reparation to First Nations women who have been systematically marginalized and disenfranchised, both socially and economically. Let's raise some money and let's be blown away by what we can do when we work together. So, as quickly as I can, here are the prizes for the donation raffle. Angela, whom you met on our Saw Win episode, is a jewelry maker that you can find on Instagram at unearthed.minerals, and she has donated a sterling silver broom necklace. The piece is two and a half inches. I've seen a picture of it. Again, listeners, I'm so jealous. Obviously, it would be very sus if Risa or I won any of these prizes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're not entering, but like, yeah, I'm jealous of y'all for having this opportunity. <laughs> so uh, a s sterling silver broom, individually placed silver bristles. They slice and polish their raw materials, traditional metal smithing techniques, and so on. The broom is body adornment with magic included, Angela says. Loretta, who you know on Instagram as the Death Witch, and you also met her on our Saw Win episode, um, has recently, time is uh, a blur right now, but so I want to say recently, but it might not be that recently because time is a blur, uh, launched her own line of magical goods. So she is putting together a gift pack for one of you lucky, lucky witches. It's going to be at least one of each type of item that she does. So an oil, a powder, an incense, and a scrub. And Loretta says maybe a couple of new goodies she has in the works. It'll be a surprise, but it's coming from Loretta, the Death Witch. So it'll be a good surprise. That I know for sure. You can also check out her range at thedeathwitch.black. Monifa Walker, whom you also know of, has been a guest on the podcast. She's offering a 60-minute natal reading chart. You've heard her so much on the show. She's gifted and a brilliant astrologer. This is a great opportunity to potentially get her insights and, of course, make a reparation at the same time. You can find her at monifawalker.co.uk. Do you remember the Letha episode where we had a lawyer named Melissa? She makes art prints as the salted moon. She does monoprint using herbs. She mindfully links colors and magical symbols and herbs. A lot of them come from her own garden. And she uses the mono print to make these prints. <laughs> and, you know, she's not precious. You can hang them on the wall, sure. Or you can use them as your altar cloth. You can use them as a one-time spell. You know, rip them, tear them, write on them. She's donated three prints. So you have three opportunities to get in on this. And if you miss it, she is at etsy.com slash shop slash salted moon magic. There's even more. Aaron Heiser at EK Heiser makes customized birth chart essential oil perfume. Each one is a custom blend of essential oils based on your natal chart a combination of plants ruled by the planets of your sun, moon, and rising signs. Erin uses her intuition and her nose, all of her senses, to create these. Um, if you win this, you have to know these placements in your charts. So just keep that in mind, you know. For those of us <laughs> who don't know exactly what time we were born, maybe that's not the one for you. But we have more. But wait, there's even more. Nick, who works out of the Cauldron Black in Salem, Massachusetts, super witchy, and you can find on Instagram, Instagram at Urban Wizard. Now, Nick has been doing 
like being a professional witch for 35 years. So basically when I didn't know how to spell the word witch, <laughs> Nick was working as a witch. And he, I can't thank you so much, Nick. This is crazy. He has donated $500. So that's like a package worth $500 if you were to go and, you know, buy it from him. And again, 35 years of experience. Um, he, he has worked with clients and students, public and private. He's ordained and initiated in a variety of traditions, but he specializes in yoga and the intersection of classical yoga theory and modern witchcraft practice. He says that he operates through a multidimensional animist lens with a focus on Greek folklore. And I'll say this again, Nick's content welcomes all traditions at all levels, and if you prefer, can be approached in a purely secular way, which I thought was really interesting. Now, Nick is donating this personally, so you won't be going through Cauldron Black in Salem. You'll be going directly through Nick at Urban Wizard. Thank you again. And the last one is from our own granddaughter crow <laughs> you'll get a one hour session with granddaughter crow valued at two hundred dollars you'll meet gdc like in a second <laughs> so i'll let her describe what a session might look like but in the meantime you can check her out at www.granddaughtercrow.com You must be a witch. If you want to support the Missing Witches Project, you can do so by buying our book, reviewing it on Amazon and Goodreads, using offer code Missing Witches when you shop at Foxglove Farm, become a Patreon patron, or pick up some Missing Witches merch at Tee Public.